Hey, welcome to the Sisyphus 55 podcast. Today we're joined with Anthony Coleus, who's the co-founder of Stasher and an Oxford graduate. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, how you doing? Um, yeah, my name is Anthony, Anthony Collius. Um, I co-founded a business called Stasher. Basically, when you stay at Airbnbs and stuff, you can leave your bags with local businesses around the world. Um, you know, as you may have guessed, that that's left me with some free time this year. <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've been we've been doing a few other things, including a philosophy podcast called uh, The Morality of Everyday Things, um, and recently a social enterprise for carbon offsetting called Tree Points. Um, and also binge watching a lot of a lot of uh, you know philosophy related YouTube content. Uh, hence this happy marriage. Yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, your uh, your success led you uh, to land on the Forbes thirty under thirty. Also, if I'm if I remember. Yeah, correctly. yeah. I, it was um, a little surreal, but that that um, you know actually ironically the the timing of that was so funny um, because we were announced on the European list this March um, and. Basically, you know, uh, I can't recall the North American timescale, but March was really when, when you know, things got bad here in the UK. Yeah. Everything was shut down, you know. So it was, it was the funniest timing in the world. Like, we'd just ridden such a high. We'd just raised, like, two or three million dollars. Everything was looking great. And we heard, heard about this thing. We're like, yeah, no, that's far away in China. <laughs> and then suddenly, like, everything was shutting down. <laughs> and, you know, like, getting onto, onto that was, you know, something we'd, barely barely had a chance to like acknowledge let alone celebrate yeah oh, i mean it's good you got in there while you well you could <laughs> before it all, uh, yeah. all travel was restricted and everything <laughs> yeah. yeah um so we'll we'll get into the uh uh your business ventures um later but first um out of personal curiosity um because like oxford's totally one of my dream schools um, what was your experience um, studying in Oxford? I believe you took the, uh, it was the PPE program, the politics, philosophy, economics. Um, yes. Yeah, it was, it was, it was PPE. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's interesting trying to explain Oxford, uh, particularly to North Americans, because it does kind of have a, a very romantic image. Um, it's honestly a, a totally unique system uh, or institution rather, even even within the kind of context of the UK, um, you, the more you read about it, the more it's actually kind of concerning how how much Oxford and Cambridge kind of dominate um, the kind of educational landscape and, and institutional landscape. Um, interesting fact for you, I am I'm pretty sure this is still true. Every single prime minister since the Second World War um, has been an Oxford graduate, minus one. Um, and that one was um, Scottish, uh, Gordon Brown. So he, he actually went to uh, St. Andrews, which is uh, basically Scottish Oxford. Oh, um, <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Wow, yeah. that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Matt, it's insane. And, and on top of that, like, I think 20 come from one school. Um, so there's, there's a real kind of institutional inequality issue um, at, um, in the UK. But, you know, at least, at least Oxford and Cambridge, anyone can apply to. It's not like... It, it, compared to the North America, we we have like a flat fee structure. But basically, to explain a little bit about it, it's it's a really interesting traditional um, educational institution. There's lots of kind of weird intricacies and weird societies and stuff. And um, obviously, the education is ridiculously high quality. I mean, you get to spend kind of with a group of it can be just you up to tops five people. Um, you'll sit down every week with one or two tutors who are kind of world leaders in their, in their respective fields, which is very cool. Um, it's also obviously <laughs> it's, it's quite insane that when you, you know, when you sit down with some of these people, you'll be talking about studies or work uh, and, you know, maybe sometimes you have to critique it and it's like, actually I'm, I, you know, I'm critiquing the work of the person uh, that I'm, I'm sitting here discussing it with because they happen to be like the world leader in that particular field. Uh, I remember my like my political theory teacher was um, was like the like foremost person in I, I can't remember what it was I think Samaritanism or something like that some some kind of conception of how we form our duties to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was funny to kind of debate that with him. But um, I mean it's super fun, super interesting. Uh, it has a collegiate setup, uh, which is kind of unique. Uh, which which means that like basically, you know how in Hogwarts they have like Gryffindor and, yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Hufflepuff and stuff. Yeah. So basically, yeah, you you have these kind of like 
I don't want to say houses because they're much bigger than that, where you actually do most of your, get most of your actual teaching, you live, you get your food and stuff like that. Um, it's broken into those respective colleges. Okay. Um, and, and is the PPE program, is that uh, its own college or is it like shared between like the politics, like the political department, philosophy department, economics department? S- so the way the way that it works is that it's it's shared across the the departments. The departments are are kind of um, a, I don't know a superstructure above the colleges, right? Okay. Um. So it's shared it's shared between them, um. But you know so the way it works is that basically each college will look at what tutors or, or you know professors they have available, uh, and they'll say that okay we can take you know five to eight um, PPEists, you know physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, etc. per year. Um, and then you actually have to apply to the individual colleges. You don't apply to just the uni, to the, to the, I, I know that it might be confusing because I know Americans call university college, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah they, it, you apply to like, you apply to like the houses, the, the substructures. Um, but then you still can go to the departments for like lectures and stuff like that. It's a, it's an interesting system because you kind of get like the big uni experience and the small uni experience all in one. Mm. Yeah, no, that does sound, that's, that sounds really nice. Um, and specifically the program that you were in, um, mm-hmm. could you go into depth kind of uh, what sort of um, educational experience that is? I mean, you're covering basically three very important uh, fields in the humanities and social sciences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think uh, I don't know whether the reputation kind of extends across the Atlantic, but like certainly in the UK, it's it is considered like the uh, politician's degree. Um, it was, you know, it, I think there's some ridiculous level of dis, uh, of representation within our Houses of Parliament um, of people who did study PPE. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, in some sense, I kind of think like it's the sort of education that at least to some level, it would be amazing for every citizen of modern society to access because it, it does kind of poke, it, 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 it encourages you to kind of have a breadth of understanding across so many of the requirements for being an engaged citizen, um, for, you know, analytical thinking and breaking things down. The way it was specifically structured in terms of education was also quite loose. So, um, or, or, you know, it could be molded how you like. You could focus very heavily in one of the three, you know, more often than not, people pick like two of the three to kind of split across and would even drop the third piece altogether um and you could do tripartite you could do all three through the whole course but obviously then there's a lot of base material to cover so it gets a bit harder Hmm. but um i i personally focused a lot on i to some extent i was tripartite but basically i focused on the economics and politics but took on uh political philosophy particularly that was like my favorite thing um, but less sort of, you know, the other, you know, metaphysics and whatever else like that, that, that I found less kind of engaging. And what, uh, what sort of political philosophy most caught your attention? Um, what sort of thinker or uh, view kind of got you into this subject? Mm, I mean, I was, I was pretty taken by Mills. I think um, John Stuart Mills' kind of conception of utilitarianism kind of uh, on the one hand i found you know personally really convincing uh, I, I suppose maybe that's kind of more moral than political mm-hmm. but um it, i mean it kind of has implications on your or on your method of viewing the political um his kind of method of you know saying okay consequential but you need to think midterm and sometimes heuristics means that like you can't you know realistically think th- everything through so then you kind of manage to shoehorn in some kind of conceptions of duties and rules into a consequential framework. Mm-hmm. Um, more specifically for, um, to to politics, I'd probably say John Rawls, um, which is like the, the you know the bloody classic undergrad answer, but <laughs> that, that's my answer for you. Um, yeah, I, I just think you know for for anyone who doesn't know him, simple thought experiment. Um, you know, imagine imagine you're trying to structure society and decide the fairest way to do it. Um, you know, there's a few ways to phrase it, but one way I was uh, I heard that was quite nice is, you know, imagine, imagine everyone has a lawyer assigned to them to argue how to structure society in their favor. Right. Um, and, and all the lawyers are flying somewhere and they're meeting up to talk about it. Uh, and they all, you know, they haven't bothered looking at their, their briefcases, their files on you because they're lazy lawyers. Uh, and, and, you know, they arrive and they realize they lost it. Right. And so they have to, they have to argue amongst themselves knowing only, you know, 
that you are that you are people within the society they don't know any kind of as he would describe it morally arbitrary factors such as you know your race your gender things like that mm-hmm. and his kind of conception of how a society would naturally end up kind of follows from that starting point which he kind of calls the veil of ignorance right yeah no that that's a very uh it's it's a very good sort of um representation of liberalism in general like this idea that yeah at its basis there's these moral uh, morally arbitrary factors that um once we filter those out we can actually come to certain um universally agreed upon ideas of what justice is and how yeah. society um should be um i guess performed yeah i mean his i mean his literally the title of his work um to, on, on this you know topic is justice is fairness so his his perception is basically that justice is is described as what is the most fair uh, and he describes as uh, he basically says fairness is described as uh, I always get confused between min maxing or max minning, but basically it's only as it's only as good as the worst person in society. Now or worst off person. Yeah, from from what my uh, I mean this I think this was like two years ago when I took my last uh, political theory course. Um, wasn't Rawls? He was a bit more critical of of utilitarianism. And then John Stuart mm-hmm. Mill was kind of like a, a more he was almost like a, a qualified utilitarian because he he didn't necessarily agree with Bentham's notion of just like pain and pleasure. Like he did think that I think, for example, exactly, it was, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it's better to be Socrates sad than a pig happy or, or something of that sort. So exactly, how, exactly. So these are your two favorite thinkers. How do you kind of uh, reconcile? Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's it's. It's interesting because, like you say, I think John Stuart Mill, John Stuart Mill's kind of perception, as you said, does manage to take the kind of core consequentialism, pleasure, pain, but but manages to kind of take it beyond quite a simple short term calculus, which I think is kind of more appropriate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and it, the the use of you know heuristics as a as a method of achieving you know the maximal consequential benefit in the midterm is kind of his way of doing that. Um, I mean, some other, some other specific examples. I, I like Rawls, but Rawls is the kind of you know quintessential, uh, like super super liberal. I think that there are you know aspects of his of his um, theory that might be kind of limited or or not explain certain circumstances well, and that's kind of where I'd lean more on Mills. So where do I reconcile them? Mm, Mills isn't Bentham and. To the extent that they don't reconcile, it tends to be that's the exact reason why I like both of those and not just one. Okay, that's a that's a funny way of answering that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fair point. Um, and because you also uh, heavily studied economics, were there any mm-hmm. um, sort of economic theorists or theories that um, really um, kind of established your your worldview uh, during your time at Oxford? I think it's. I think, okay, so the interesting thing on this topic that's super popular to talk about nowadays is less um, is less kind of a specific theory. Like, I, I don't want to say, oh, you know, Keynes' theory of blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and more just the kind of overarching way that economics is taught um, in the modern day. Uh, I think basically, you know, a lot of what we would now take as kind of neoliberal capitalism uh, is, is based on, is based on, the economics that's been taught for the past 10, 20 years. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, we're kind of increasingly saying, like, maybe this isn't that relevant. Maybe this doesn't make sense. Um, you know, maybe competitive markets basically never exist. Um, or, you know, to the extent that they exist, you know, they, they don't happen naturally. Um, maybe, you know, to name a theory, uh, but this wasn't really something that I um, took up at uni, something that kind of I've more recently kind of been interested in. But to look at kind of monetary theories, maybe kind of the Friedman style um, monetary theory is, is kind of not really fit for purpose. And uh, I think there's a modern strand called modern monetary theory, which basically says that the conception of government is like, we need to make money available to do X is actually the complete backwards way to think about it when you consider the fact that government creates money, mm-hmm. right? Um, as, as a result of that, actually government can can create however much money it wants, right? It is the sovereign power over its territory. Um, and actually the, the question is more how much should we tax in order to keep 
the negative impacts of printing, you know, as much money as we want within check. Um, so basically, when you know, when people argue, you know, can we afford to do X? The answer is never, um, you know, we can't afford it. The answer is, are we willing to then follow the kind of necessary economic policies that come thereafter to ensure that we don't, for example, experience hyperinflation? Well, um, yeah, but, in in Canada, we've had. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure how the the stimulus uh, worked during the pandemic in England, but uh, our prime minister has been very, at least during the summer, he established a CERB program where it, you mm-hmm. were basically given two thousand dollars a month um, if I think you earned up to five thousand last year and your employment was somehow infect or affected by uh, the coronavirus and. Mm. I've seen a lot of dialogue back and forth in Canada specifically about this theory because we right now we have a government that is very lax and, and open to spending great sums of money. And mm-hmm. it's really uh, it, it's shown that our government's our government appears to be very much a proponent of this. And perhaps this theory does work during emergency times. Um, but yeah. but how has this uh how do you feel this this idea has been represented in in England during this uh, national international emergency? Interestingly, I feel like in the UK it hasn't really entered the dialogue because I think essentially the argument that we're still you know we still hear tons is um, you know oh the you know the the money taps are on and we'll have to pay it back mm-hmm. right which again is kind of that implicit understanding of of governmental budgeting and economics to be, you know, some sort of, you know, large scale mirroring of, of a household, mm-hmm. which just which just isn't actually accurate, seemingly, um, because I think the, the interesting thing is, or I, I'd be interested to, to kind of get your confirmation. Do you think when you say that Canada has has um, has to some extent kind of embraced this ideology, do you mean that in an explicit sense? Is it, the, is it something that's actually being discussed or is it just that people are spending a ton of money so so they must be prescri- uh, prescribing to this um understanding of economic theory yeah like i think it, it it's probably a circumstantial uh ex- maybe not explicit but um implicit uh sort of uh mm. embrace of this theory because i think during emergency times um the government kind of felt okay the most important thing right now is for families to put food on the table and um you know to not have huge unemployment um to not have mm. uh um just you know a total total loss and like uh, market spending and so forth yeah um so it could have been a circumstance they could have just kind of read maybe these these would have been the consumer habits in Canada and uh or it could have been maybe they embrace these these theories beforehand and this is kind of a welcomed opportunity to put it in practice with um not not to say maybe the potential for terrible side effects but because every economy in the world right now has pretty much we're seeing a bunch of different experiments going on over government spending yeah. and so forth um that you know th- people won't be so blamed if this doesn't work out in the end because you know hind- hindsight is 2020 in, in in more more ways than one um oh man yeah. I, I think that's that's you know basically the the um <laughs> the answer to all covid policies uh, <laughs> yeah it's 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 all like you're not culpable if you're following the crowd right yeah so that's why everyone has pretty homogenous policy but and um, and we're we're neighbors to the to the u.s right now and i i think it was mm. today they announced the i i didn't read very much about this so i might be misinterpreting it but there's a stimulus package of like six hundred dollars um and uh money machine go burn yeah and uh <laughs> but but the just the the crazy unemployment and i mean i don't know how much it's linked to the civil unrest um but these huge lines uh for food and uh mm-hmm. it's i don't know i i do think canada's a bit the way that our politics works we are affected by uh what happens in america but i also think we're somewhat reactive to it we tend to make little adjustments here or there um, on, on a much yeah, smaller I mean, I, scale, you know, I, I, li- I like to think for Europeans, Canada is kind of like U.S. light. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. like the <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it's a comfortable stepping stone between Europe and the U.S. Yeah, um, and I, I think on like you used the term experiment earlier. Yeah, like this, 
this is actually the kind of thing that it, it's hard to run economic experiments. So often studies will refer to what they call natural experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, this is the greatest natural experiment that could have happened over our time. I think that, um, I think, I, I wonder, I, I'm curious if there's some people with explicit kind of considerations around this. Or to what extent it's kind of just, you know, total situation and necessity. And now that it's happened, people are kind of looking at stuff and like, oh, we always told people that if we spent, you know, if we just gave people a ton of money, you know, the entire economy would fall apart. And we had to do that. And it didn't. Well, the uh, I mean, it's interesting because Andrew Yang uh, kind of mm -hmm. he, yeah. he became Probably very well. UBI, right. Yeah. As a, as a candidate for UBI. And uh and it was an interesting policy topic that they could discuss. But when the pandemic hit, I, I mean, there were so many articles all of a sudden about, uh, you mm -hmm. know, should we actually implement this, <clears throat> especially for yeah. instances such as this, because it seems like a market um, that doesn't really provide a, a substantial uh, welfare um, net, safety net, um, mm -hmm. is not suited for a time of like absolute crisis where you know a lot of people are going to lose their jobs because um it's required to not go to work or there's less spending yep. because there's uh health measures put in place um yep so yeah well, it's think, interesting one thing oh sorry one thing i'd say one thing i'd say on that though is that if you if you look at lots of the reporting on ubi it still didn't kind of reflect this mo this understanding of modern monetary theory whereby you know, as the person who prints the money, um, you can spend as much as you want. Um, it's just about effective policy thereafter to stop issues like inflation, right? Mm -hmm. You still see headlines like, how do we afford UBI, right? Yeah. Which is which is fundamentally not understanding that point that the government can print the money that it wants. It's just then about taxing that money efficiently so that the money supply doesn't increase um, to the extent that it causes unreasonable inflation. Some inflation is good. I mean, you, you want you want non-zero inflation because that's that's the incentive to spend mm -hmm. or invest. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe to to simplify it because I think even even after, um, and you've already articulated it fairly well. But um, how could you explain when almost all markets now are tied to global markets, and these global markets mm -hmm. are kind of reliant on the neoliberalism that was kind of adapted in mm -hmm. the in the eighties Reagan Thatcher era. Um, mm -hmm. how does modern monetary theory, um, adjust for inflation? Um, even though, even though this country mm -hmm. in itself can, can produce, uh, its own money yeah. and therefore it's not exactly yeah. a replicant of, uh, household, um, economics. Um, how, how does it actually account for not causing hyperinflation when the government spends, uh, so much money? Cause I, I think that's the, that's pretty much the yeah. main point that most people would, uh, have some sort of gripe with. So, so this it, it's interesting because the reason I find this theory so in, so like intellectually interesting is because it's it's less of a kind of we need to change everything or or you know huge policy implications more of kind of like a narrative or way of thinking. Um, so, I mean, the, the actual outcome is relatively similar, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, during the previous understanding, um, you you would have to tax in order to raise the money for that, right? The fundamental difference is the kind of timing of it, right? Uh, the fundamental difference is that with modern monetary theory, you can spend the money and then tax to remove excess money supply from the system to, uh, to avoid that kind of excessive inflation, right? So in short, the answer is you have to tax effectively. If you're going to spend a ton of money, that means you're putting a ton of money into the market. That means you're crowding out private spending. That means you're driving up the prices of things, right? Um, so you need to tax a ton in order to kind of remove some of that money supply and keep inflation in check. Um, the fundamental difference becomes that you, know, you, you kind of remove that we can't afford it, i.e. it's not possible. And suddenly every political question is we don't think it's worth the like the tax implications that would follow. Right. Which is which is very different because I think particularly if you think about the standard conservative fallback. It's not we don't want to. It's we can't. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, I think and one of the kind of replies to that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, you tax people in wealthier brackets so that they're not uh, you're not affecting like lower income families with these high taxes. You're, you're increasing taxes for the wealthy, mm -hmm. basically. Is, is that a, a, like a potential response? Um, it, I mean, it's certainly a potential response. 
I guess you need to do that effectively. I mean, a big part of it also would be business, because if you think if you think about um, you know governments crowding out talent and stuff as well, that will impl- that will have implications for businesses more than individuals. But yes, like I think you know to kind of capture the modern zeitgeist, irrespective of whether you agree or agree with kind of the narrative. Um, overlay of modern monetary theory or more classical neoliberal capitalism um, the outcome is that you basically want to tax the people who can afford it more and there's it, you know there's never going to have been a time more in history where there are people who can definitely afford it mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> well and, and one of the issues then is is also how do you define how much money this person has and then also how do you account for the, the movement and uh, reallocation of assets and, and money and, you know, offshore accounts. And I mean, if you remember mm. the Panama papers, it, it is, it's, it's quite a mess. Man, that was, yeah. that was such a fucking, uh, yeah. no, it's okay. sorry. Yeah, it's actually, okay. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. think there's a lot of that, like a uh, uh, 13 year olds watching this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that was, that was the biggest disappointment, right? Like, I remember that came out and you're like, yeah, everything's going to change. There's nowhere to hide. And then like six months later, it was just gone. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, and it's yeah. and it's partially because there there isn't, I mean, there's certainly, you could, uh, I didn't read all of them, but there is certain criminal activity you could argue for going on in there. But overall, it was a release of papers of people pretty much knowing how to cheat the system in a, in a legal way. Yeah. 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 Not illegally. Right. Yeah. Which is... Y- y- the the problem is, yeah, you know, loads of people have spoken tons about this, but the the extent to which the only people who have the power to change that are beholden to or a product of a system where they don't really have the incentives to. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. No. It's a it's a big uh, multi dimensional um, mess that will. I mean, it, sometimes it takes. Uh, crisis <laughs> to uh to unveil yeah, the best change. times best time for change yeah yeah don't tell me just a little bit whenever or you know when everything was going down there wasn't a little part of you that was like i'm so excited for a zombie apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah well it <laughs> depends on if they're the fast ones or the slow zombies that's the <laughs> <laughs> obviously the slow ones yeah you yeah just hit with baseball bats and stuff <laughs> um so, uh, transitioning from talking about zombies, how do you think your uh, education has um, led to you starting up your uh, company? Oh man, you know I'm actually I'm actually very sad to say um, <laughs> the exact opposite. It okay. didn't. I, I I actually ended up doing this in spite of. Um, for any UK listeners, they might understand this, but and I'm sure that this exists in the US as well, but. You know, for for all it's great for all the great things about it, um, you know, some of the best educational institutions in the UK, most of the innovation they do really is spinning out high tech PhDs into businesses, which also more often than not is not you know necessarily you know huge. Some of them can be huge businesses, but more often than not, they kind of spin it out, and then in order for that to thrive in the in the kind of modern market that needs to be snapped up by a larger company that can actually fund it because they, they have technology but they might not have a product. Mm-hmm. So I kind of feel like instead Oxford and Cambridge are kind of this 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 funnel that kind of pressures everyone into um, you know becoming consultants, bankers, lawyers, accountants, uh, those kind of very standard career paths. Um, which, you know, is you know, some of those are, you know, fair enough, respectable uh, professional services and they may suit the the things that people want to do, but um, I think it's a shame that you know, considering people, people can have some very high aspirations and you know want to help people and stuff. That the majority of us end up uh, in you know large consulting firms sitting in parking lots in industrial states yeah. and small towns in the UK, making powerpoints and deciding who to fire. <laughs> Yeah. Do you do you think uh, there's some fundamental um, institutional problems uh, with regards to universities and also just kind of the the cultural assumption when you're growing up that you should go to a university and pursue some sort of um, higher mm-hmm. level education? Do you think that there's there's maybe some possible fixes that can be implemented, um, small scale you know- or large scale? Again, this is kind of relevant to COVID, right? Because because university dis- uh, education is so disrupted. Um, I I really valued my education for kind of those kind of intrinsic, like I feel like it 
you know, to posit in a positive way, uh, help shape me as a person. Um, did it provide me many career ready skills? Um, well, it provided me the career ready skills that it's designed for, which is, you know, it, it's a system that's designed to create bureaucrats. It, I mean, if you if you think about the history of institutional education, um, most you know most development of major institutions originated from needs related to kind of the war machines of, of nations of old mm-hmm. um, and they needed bureaucrats so that's what that's what university institutions were made to create so did it prepare me to become a civil servant yeah absolutely did it prepare me to to function in the modern world where you know we, we use digital products so you know skills around that are useful understanding of online advertising is useful I mean you're you're a YouTube creator right like would it have prepared me to be a YouTube creator <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> Well, we we had difficulty setting up the bloody recording thing. But yeah, that's that is, true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, uh, and I think interestingly now, there is a there is kind of more of these options where you can develop some of those skills and you can develop them quickly and cheaply. Um, and more and more large companies actually realize they have an incentive to do that because there's a skills gap. You know, we have all of these people who have excellent degrees um, and they're expecting really good salaries, but I still need to teach them how to be a UX designer from scratch because they actually didn't learn that at their uni degree. So there is kind of this this disconnect there. And then I think kind of even beyond that or even worse is, you know, aside from the fact that maybe unis aren't preparing us to, to generate quote unquote real value, even worse, a lot of these companies that people are moving into um, are actually detracting value, right? We're, mm-hmm. we're you know, it, I mean, the classic example of the, of the 90s, noughties was, was um, finance, right? Or I say nineties, noughties, more like the fifties through noughties, um, was like you know the, you have. I remember I read this this essay by the this excellent um, Harvard professor, and he was just lamenting how sad he was that you know he talks to his best students, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm off to join a job at Goldman Sachs," and he's like, "Why? You can change the world for the better. You can do something, and instead you're going to move stocks around on a secondary market or." use all that I've taught you to make an algorithm to, you know, trade fucking, uh, yeah, again, sorry. Well, well, uh, to trade. Yeah. Go on, sorry. No, like, like what you're saying, it reminds me of, um, it was in one of my psychology classes. We were looking at a study about law students. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was overall yeah. the overarching, uh, kind of results were that people that go into law school and also just a lot of, uh, grad students, generally suffer a decline in mental health. But what was interesting was mm. they, they would um, measure their kind of extrinsic versus intrinsic aspirations um, before going into law school. And the lawyers or the the kind of undergrads that had the most intrinsic aspirations, as in, you know, they, they really focused on humanitarian work. They really wanted to make the world a better place. Um, they wanted to be very altruistic um, and so forth, make substantial change. They were the most likely mm. at the end uh, to uh, re- ha- like um, experience a, a great degree in aspirational change in which they're now mm. valuing extrinsic aspirations. And the reason why is because if, if they're intrinsically inspired mm. to pursue a law degree, um, they're going to fly through all the classes because they're so motivated. They're just, they're so, they want to do this. This is the thing they want to do. Whereas someone more materialistically, extrinsically minded, they might kind of be like, oh, this is all just a lot of work in order for me to make money. So there, there's that motivating factor that's a lot more mm-hmm. honest. The problem is, is because they're excelling, a lot of these law professors latch onto them and they see how successful they are and they start going, hey, like uh, I know some people at this firm or you should really go and look uh uh, like at this position and the instant, the actual institution um, at university mm. kind of channels them into these more extrinsically focused um, high paying mm. corporate jobs. And then the sad result is that those in high paying um, corporate law um, positions generally don't have a great increase in mental health uh, in a positive sense. They, they're usually, oh, they're usually not doing <laughs> very well, especially because they realize and I mean, this is probably extrapolating from the data, but mm. probably looking back at their old identity and kind of having a bit of a crisis and going, what happens? Like I was so busy and it's like, I forgot who I was. It's, it's a little bit cliche, yeah. but it was interesting to see in, in a study. Mate, cliche, cliches exist generally for a reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I, I mean, I'm kind of, I, I, I don't know how old you are, but um, I'm, I'm now at the age where I'm starting to see that. Um, I'm, I'm 26. Most people in my year are a bit older than me. I was very young for my year. Um, so they're now at that stage where, you know, they've, they've gone through the consulting or, or lawyer gig. Um, you know, a, a lot of them have kind of, have kind of dealt with that cognitive dissonance where they had that intrinsic motivation to do great things. They had to balance that with some extrinsic at motivation. And, and I think a lot of them kind of reach compromises in their head where it's like, okay, doing this enables me to go on to do X, Y, Z at some point. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, or like, it, it, I think one thing that's worth mentioning in the modern context versus, you know, 50 years ago is it's, you know, the main thing that people need or want to buy in their lives, you know, a secure place to live is more expensive than ever. Right. Mm-hmm. So everyone's saying, Oh, I just need to do a few years to, to build up a deposit for a place or, or to build up the credibility to go do whatever. Um, and then suddenly, you know, suddenly a lot of them are looking back and saying, when, when am I supposed to make that move? How do I make that move? I've kind of got these, the term is golden handcuffs where like I, you know, yeah, I'm earning a ton of money. Suddenly I, it's really hard to let go of that and you don't know how to make that shift out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think in the case, a lot of, a lot of my friends, like the kind of realization that back to what we we're saying earlier, uh, you know, they didn't develop skills that means that they can go and do things from like, they don't know how to operate outside of, you know, the, the environment of the firm that they're in. Mm-hmm. So yeah, definite, definite kind of quarter life crises I see. And then, you know, the classic is to take a year, go around Vietnam and find yourself. <laughs> <laughs> So, so did you, uh, uh, I'm assuming then that you, you left university and, uh, and then you developed more technical mm. skills in order to, uh, get into the world of entrepreneurship. Um, how did you develop those skills? So kind of, a, uh, kind of a mix. I, I'm not a professional developer. Um, I, I can hack together little things. I mean, the devs on my team will probably listen to this and be like, no, he can't. Uh, but, but like, I can do little things. But, um, but really, I was kind of more focused. If you think about our businesses, uh, the tech isn't that difficult. The hard part is more the business element. Um, I, I kind of, I always felt that personally, I didn't really have a choice. I think a lot of people might fall into this where my, my personality type, kind of with some reflection and, and some, you know, having picked up some basic kind of uh, psychology uh, terminology is that I'm maybe not super agreeable within a professional context, mm-hmm. which is to say like, you know, there, I, I think people enjoy working with me, but I don't enjoy having a boss. Um, so I kind of didn't really have a choice. Uh, <laughs> the, the only, the only way to avoid that is to try and do something for yourself. Um, and I mean, really, you know, how, how do you pick up these skills? It's, it's kind of, do you know the expression, how do you eat an elephant? No. <laughs> Take that as a no. <laughs> uh, one bite at a time, right? Right. So basically, we kind of broke things down into small, manageable bits. Uh, we started by using kind of an MVP, a simple technology um, that we didn't need to maintain much or put anything into, um, and just focused on trying to drive early traction. And, and we just kind of incrementally learned thing, learn things. Um, which is why we're probably better operators now than we were when we were 21, we being me and my co-founder. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's kind of hard to give a specific answer. My, if it's supposed to be like a kind of motivational, like, how do I go and do this thing? Like, step one, try, go, go and do something towards it and literally do, do anything, see how it fails, and then kind of incrementally try and make it slightly better. Like, set up a Facebook page, contact some people, ask some people, how can I solve X, Y, Z problem for you? Yeah, that's a, I mean, I mean, that's a recurrent. Not super practical tips there. Yeah, no, but that, that's a recurrent comment that I also see on a lot of my videos um, is how do I actually know mm. what I'm going to do for the rest of my life or, or how do I know what I want to do? Um, and it's very hard to sort of mm. capture any sort of advice for them in, in a single statement because it's such a personal question. Um how did you, and, and I, I think it's better to more capture them in just personal stories. So, so how did you kind of, uh, come mm. up with this whole, whole idea and, and kind of end up in this, in this position? Mm-hmm. So, so with regards to Stasher, um, well, actually I'll start with the easiest one. With regards to the philosophy podcast, 
we would talk about stuff at lunch. So we're like, we should record this. <laughs> uh, but with regards to Stasho, um, I used to live, for anyone who knows London, I used to live between Euston and King's Cross, uh, which are two super busy train stations. And I lived with my brother and he just always had university friends asking to leave stuff at our house uh, while they went back home for like a long week or whatever. Um, and we, you know, we were interested in kind of having a project to kind of tinker with and learn about entrepreneurship. So we said, maybe we can do something with that, like make a really simple website, let people store stuff in our homes. Um, incidentally, it was a great way to talk to every person uh, who first used the services. Um, and it was kind of from there that, like I said, like the, the first service sucked. Like it was, it was meeting up with a random kid and giving him your bags and he takes it to his house and you know you call him when you when you come back and he'd give it to you um that was you know obviously that was sketchy uh we tried going to the stations and just talking to random people like hey do you need to store your bags uh you know in in understandably people just kind of <laughs> looked at us weirdly like um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> please please leave me alone but um that was kind of like why we started and how we started we realized businesses made more sense we ended up working with hotel chains and stuff now we operate in like maybe 250 cities and um, we were um, on course to store about a million bags last year, but, oh, sorry, this year, but, you know, yeah. obvious circumstance. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the, the first step was just to try something. And I, I guess relevant to you, you know, people, I'm sure people ask you all the time, how do I become a YouTuber? Yeah. Yeah. Um uh, what do you what do you say to them? I don't. I start by making YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, I mean, I think that it's it's you don't want the goal to be how do I become a YouTuber? It it really starts at like what the idea is, um, and the idea should almost be able to oh, like man, you. Say, you sound like Alan Watts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No God, that's I don't know if that's a compliment all the time, but um it's it's <laughs> like like you need you need it to wasn't. actually no, no, no. <laughs> you need to actually offer um something that's interesting and like you find interesting um to the point where you actually mm. wouldn't care if other people uh, would take an interest in it you just like it um and uh 100%. unfortunately that's not very good advice for how do i become a youtuber you're kind of i'm circumventing the the question because if you want to become a YouTuber, you just um, mm. invest in uh, equipment. You research how to make really clickbait articles. You slap an attractive girl on oh, the thumbnail. Well, I think I think I think you're being unfair. <laughs> well, no, because because if, if you're if you're if you're sole... like all of your attractive girls, right? <laughs> if 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 your sole purpose is uh, um, to just become a YouTuber, then I I actually do think that there's very mm simple um steps to it but you'd have to be very kind of uh soulless in, in a sense like your work your work would have to be very mm. uh you know eye-catching and um, not probably not necessarily super novel because there is a lot of popular videos now that don't um i wouldn't necessarily say add a lot of value maybe like some level of entertainment or pushing some sort of product um but they're they're very much leeching on very basic uh human um attention uh and now do you do you mm. want to be a youtuber that is bringing something to the table that's actually interesting that's a that's kind of going with what i said uh before yeah. which is you you need an actual idea that you really believe in mm. but i think as well relevant to youtube relevant to the startup stuff that i've done uh, i think i think you do need really to be doing something that you know you you, you couldn't you, you're doing because you want to right mm -hmm. like there were periods where there was just two of us somewhere um and it was kind of like the, the kind of classic like you imagine two guys in a garage and like it was fun like there was nowhere else i wanted to be um and and to your point on youtube like it's there are going to be there's going to be an extended period um you know for anything worth doing there's going to be an extended period where it's probably not, you know, it, it's not going to be you put it out there and bang, like, yeah, I, I've made it to a million. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a grind. And, and when you don't choose something that you genuinely enjoy, you're going to give up when you hit that, that point. Or it's going, to be, it's going to be very hard to kind of convince yourself to kind of push through that for the risk that it never picks up, mm -hmm. right? It has to be something that you genuinely 
are doing if, if for no other reason so that you can look back in a year's time and be like, oh, it's cool. I made that. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I'd, I'd agree with all those points. I, and on on that point, since you are uh, the co-founder of this company um, and you've also had a background mm-hmm. in uh, looking at all of these different ideas regarding economics, philosophy, um, what do you think we can do mm-hmm. to make work more fulfilling, both from a kind of corporate managerial position, but also at the the individual level? So, so how can how can actual businesses make work more fulfilling mm-hmm. for their employees, and perhaps how can economic systems? Mm-hmm. Um, but also on a on a more individual mm-hmm. level, how can you find work that you find more fulfilling? So, so kind of like so we go basically micro macro. Right? Yes. Um, if that's a fair way of interpreting that. So I'd say macro, I think, first of all, too many employers make a huge mistake, um, which is, is kind of like measuring false economies around productivity. And I think, to be fair, again, um, current crisis has, has been kind of a natural experiment to that end, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with regards to one specific element, work from home, right? I think that from our perspective as a company, we have always been actually fairly relaxed regarding, for example, hours, right? Uh, and our, our understanding is that basically, you know, pushing people to work um, very hard hours in the long, in the mid to long term, in terms of in terms of productivity due to happiness, being well rested, etc., uh, and also you know replacement costs, like you're going to you know kind of end up annoying or pushing out some people, um, so you'll end up having to, you know, recruitment is more expensive than people realize because of loss and efficiency of, of the role being empty, uh, time taken by people. Like, people always underestimate how expensive it is to recruit and replace people. Um, so I think tons of companies are kind of, they, they, they're kind of measuring their productivity and how many hours are people spending staring at screen when actually, you know, fewer hours uh, and, and maybe more freedom as to how people want to do their work. So, mm-hmm. again flexible work from home policies and stuff is, is such a simple way to improve productivity at no cost um, and, and, and actually also a differentiator for hiring. Um, so then there's even more value, like you, you get access to a talent pool or are particularly motivated and, and then feel connected to your company. That's kind of like a mid macro, like what can companies do? What right. can the economy or the government do? Um, I, I personally... Or, or my co-founder co-found, and I, we kind of always, um, we kind of always say that, in a way, we we view ourselves as experiments in UBI, um, and the reason that we say that is because we both um, like acknowledge that we come from the position of privilege of being uh, middle class white men who like thanks like not purely thanks to but you know definitely not harmed by that, <laughs> managed to get into, um, you know, a, a good university, uh, had a supportive family who had the financial means to, 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 you know, make us feel comfortable taking that risk. But basically, the way that we felt starting our company is the way that everybody in the economy should feel, both because of the fact that when you alleviate that pressure, it makes people happier, which, you know, then kind of knocks on to like, uh, savings in healthcare costs mm-hmm. and, and, you know, savings in, reductions in crime because more people grew up in happy families like all of these kind of indirect effects but also because um, it does directly lead to entrepreneurship and creation of real value um, as opposed to people being like oh, I you know because of necessity I can't afford to take that risk I need to take the corporate gig so that I can save up enough to um, buy a house someday right like knowing that you you have the opportunity to achieve prosperity to be fair I said UBI that could be UBI, that could be, that could be um, UBS, Universal Basic Services, mm-hmm. instead of income. Um, that could be basically just some sort of rearranging of society um, such that housing was more affordable. So, you know, making, making first-time buyers um, more able to access the market, making investors less able to access the market for housing. I think that's one of the most criminal things we've done is turn housing into an asset, right? Yeah. Uh, imagine if imagine if you know the bread in the supermarket could be bought by investors and hoarded uh and the price could be driven up like no that's stuff people need yeah um so that's kind of the that's like the large scale macro people need that kind of mental breathing space if they're going to one feel fulfilled and actualized um and two ultimately probably be more productive 
but then so you make, make yeah i think this is this is interesting because this is this is kind of in tune with so many movements right so so you're kind of talking about um people going to work less out of the need to uh fill in some holes basically like out of necessity like the need to eat need to find housing um just basic exactly things we can all agree on should be kind of you know just uh human beings should deserve uh yep versus uh making work uh something that is adding value to your life it's something that you're doing yeah. because you intrinsically want to do it it's it's giving some level of purpose yes i think i think actually one really interesting thing about this kind of period with with covid um as it kind of relates to to um to the frankfurt school um so marcuse and people like that and their kind of conception of how capitalism affects you know even the way that we kind of identify ourselves right mm-hmm. Like it, 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 we're kind of so indoctrinated and so exhausted from our jobs that our understanding of how to enjoy free time is to consume, right? And then suddenly there's been this whole year where all you have is time to consume. And, and in, for, you know, unfortunately not for everyone, but for, in a lot of people's cases, financial security is, is secured and you just have free time, right? Mm-hmm. And the sudden realization that like actually, you know, w- one of two things, either one, I realized that my work was a big part of my purpose um, or two. Oh my God, my life doesn't have purpose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, I've met a lot of people that have made like life, uh, life changing revelations about like their career path and, and such just, just because of, I mean, we've had a lot of time to think and uh, you're, exactly. you're going to actually this, this start. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Oh no, you're, you're going to start, um, like rethinking, you know, is this thing I've been committed to this whole time actually uh, worthwhile in my life? Mm, exactly. Um, and then, sorry, the micro one that I didn't, I didn't say. So I think this is interesting because we, we so often are conditioned to think that, you know, the options that are reasonably available to us are, are all um, acceptable options, by which I mean, like, if it's legal, it's okay to do, right? Mm. Um, and, and increasingly, we're understanding that actually, like, the regulatory environment isn't perfect um, or, or, you know, particularly recently is becoming more and more imperfect as a huge technological change means that, you know, things are changing much faster than regulation can keep up with. Um, so as a result, there's so many movements where rather than waiting for, you know, for example, governments to wade in and say, OK, this is bad, this is allowed, this isn't allowed, consumers are taking it upon themselves and saying, like, you know, in the case of, you know, veganism, uh, won't buy fur, won't buy meat, um, in the case of buying from sustainable companies. Um, and I'm, I think in work, more of us should consider whether we should be taking that approach to, to the way that we choose our work, um, both because of the kind of societal moral implications, but also because actually it may be the best route to making sure that we're happy in the, in the short to midterm, right? Um, making sure that you work somewhere that actually fulfills you because that is an important part of the function of work to a human being yeah and and how do you uh, reconcile the kind of um, common narrative that we've uh, I mean especially my generation has endorsed probably because Mm -hmm. of previous generations that is that to say that I'm a different generation? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, Are you calling me old man? <laughs> uh, I'd say I'd say we're we're roughly. I'm 22, so we should be. Like, That's close yeah, enough, close man. Enough. Come on, don't make me feel old. <laughs> um, the uh, the kind of idea that uh, um, you need to do a bunch of things you don't like to eventually do the thing that you like, whether that means working, mm. uh, you know, some high end corporate job that you might not ethically agree with. But in the end, mm. you've now saved up enough money to go do something that you ethically agree with or you get to spend time. You've earned the right to not or... waste your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, like how do, how do you think do you think that that's something that should be kind of challenged more often? Do you think that the pandemic's kind of uh, made that uh, more mm. apparent that maybe that's not a, a lifestyle that a lot of people would actually agree with? Do you think there's some so, merit to that idea? So I think. I think actually this kind of relates to what we're saying about where people getting value out of their education. Like it's, it's easy for people to say, oh, that's just wishful thinking, blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm-hmm. But the truth is there is a large set of jobs that exists where you can make really good money and, and you can 
you know, at, it perhaps feel fulfilled or at the very least um, have more time to find fulfillment outside to, outside of your day to, of your day job, mm-hmm. right? And not be exhausted when you get home. Um, and and these are, I mean, basically, as I said, when when we were at Oxford, we're all funneled into you know lawyer, consultant, banker. Um, all of these jobs are hundred hour plus. You earn good money, but yeah, hundred hour plus per week. Uh, you know, but they're intense jobs. Mm-hmm. No one is telling you, hey, by the way, if you become a developer, you can work. Uh, as little as you want as a contractor or 30 to 35 hours a week, you can earn as much as a banker, lawyer, etc. Um, you can work remote, so you can take advantage of purchasing power parity to live in a country that's relatively cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's so many of these careers, but they're not the ones who are coming to your careers fair. To some extent, you know, they're, 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 they started to come through in the form of like Facebook, Google, etc. And they kind of had the whole happy campus, blah, blah, blah. But Maybe they kind of hijack the work helps fulfill purpose thing to to kind of end up being no different to, to working at an investment bank, right? right? Where, yeah, you get perks, but in reality, you're working 100 hours a week. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So so basically, yeah, there is actually a, a huge class of jobs that just aren't being advertised to people. Like become a developer, become a UX designer, start a company, all of these things are excellent ways to actually generate value for society and make money for yourself and live a comfortable life. Um, I, I think it's no coincidence that if you look at the richest people in the world, almost all of them, or I say almost all of them, a, a disproportionate amount of them make their money through owning businesses that they started. Mm-hmm. It's a really good way to make money. Yeah, no, so I, I guess uh, it's kind of this idea at the micro level, um, mm-hmm. how to make work more fulfilling or how to find work that's more fulfilling is is to just at least be aware of the fact that you don't have to ascribe to um, kind Mm. of cultural norms, that there's a lot more opportunities out there for work that are outside of just going to university or going to trade school or doing this or that specifically. It's less formulaic. There's, there's a lot of room for, for movement. And in fact, actually, so you, you, you kind of, I realized I was getting a little siloed and and thinking like, Oh, you know, we're in like taking the answer to mean how else can you earn lots of money? (laughs) No, You know, there's another alternative, like, learn to live happily without lots of money right mm-hmm. you, you kind of we all get onto this you know everyone calls it the the hamster wheel and stuff right or like or as i would call them prestige traps where especially if you're you're the kind of person who goes to high high you know high performing uni you're, you're you put yourself under this pressure you you identify as uh, it becomes part of how you identify yourself um you you kind of forget that <laughs> you're a monkey on a rock flying through space like nothing really matters so maybe you should just chill and have a good time, right? Well, you, and have you've heard of the, like the Diderot effect, um, right? Like, uh, go on. He was a uh, he was this French thinker, and he was given a large sum of money. So he bought like a I think it was like a really nice coat, and then he realized that he needed you know it would look weird that he has this really nice coat, but he doesn't have a lot of other nice things because he was kind of poor mm. beforehand. So then he spends a bunch of money on like really nice shoes. And then he realized it would look weird if he didn't also have like really nice pants. And, th- and then it's just this. Mm. So so it's a I guess it's a bit of like a lifestyle creep where you're uh, yeah. you're never actually fulfilled. And it's it's the purchase, the, the ability to purchase these things is actually um, more of a, a condemnation or imprisonment than an mm. actual like freedom. That is uh, I think it's interesting. I'm sure you're familiar as, as a psychology student yourself. I think literally like the studies on this, you know, that's not to say money is not important or money doesn't buy comfort. It, you know, when you tell someone, oh, you can be happy with that money. Like, yeah, money sure helps, though. Um, but I, I think that like, based on some studies they did, the limit where the money stops making you happier is $70,000 a year. Yeah. Is that about right? Yep. Yeah. The, yeah. The whole hedonic treadmill, uh, like after like money, money can buy you happiness until it's just kind of, it, it doesn't really do much afterwards. Yeah, like you have enough, like it, it's solved your problems. Now, you know, once you have a jacket you're happy with, you don't need a nice jacket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's, some, that's some heavy stuff, man. <laughs> and that's why that's why we will be moving to a log cabin oh, in the Rocky Mountains. Totally, yeah. Some <laughs> oh, yeah. minimalist <laughs> movement, yeah. Oh, with, with my exactly. internet connection here, I'm already living like a... <laughs> <laughs> you're practically in a lockdown. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I think that that was a very uh, engaging conversation. I definitely learned a lot. Um, you guys should definitely check out um, the podcast. Uh, what, in the name of the podcast, it's... Uh, the Morality of Everyday Things. Oh. I'll, I'll comment on the thing or something. Because we have a YouTube channel, as in like we, it's literally just videos of the, the podcast, but we don't really promote it there. Like almost all of it is in Spotify, your, whatever your podcast player is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no. And uh, yeah, check, check out some of his work. Um, follow him on Twitter. Um, thanks for coming on. Do you have any, any last words at all? Mm, oh man, I feel like that would be a good time to have thought of like a nice quote to end on. Right? <laughs> Live long and prosper. That's <laughs> Don't <funny>. use that. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think we've, we've kind of covered it in the last hour, haven't we? Yeah. No, I think that was an all round. I think we talked about everything um all right thank thank you for coming on thanks for listening Mm -hmm.